This lecture is a brief review of the cell biology that you should have had in a prerequisite course that you will need to remember for this course on histology and embryology aimed at students in dental hygiene. If that does not describe you, this course is probably not for you. One of the things that you will need to be able to do is look at images like these and spot the cells. Hopefully, by the end of this lecture, that will be a little bit easier because you'll know about the parts that make up cells and the stuff that you would find outside of cells. So a quick quiz, and you can come back to this at the end and see what the answer is. Do you think we are looking at an image of one cell, maybe tens, hundreds, thousands, or maybe millions of cells here in these two pictures? By the end of this lecture, case studies such as this one should be much easier to understand. I won't bother reading it out loud to you, but by the end of this 30 minute lecture, you should absolutely know what hyaluronic acid is and where it would be found. In the next lecture, we'll talk more about what scar tissue is. But in this one, we want to understand how hyaluronic acid might reduce scar tissue formation. So another phrase that I would like you to understand is what we mean here by a scaffold. To understand scaffolds, we need to understand a little bit of molecular biology. For instance, what is a long carbohydrate? What do we mean by that being secreted by these types of cells here, including epithelial cells and fibroblast cells? Once we kind of get a reminder of what those words mean, then these questions over here should be a lot easier to answer. For instance, where would this hyaluronic acid be found? What sort of cellular attachments might it affect? And where would large proteins found in extracellular matrix be produced within the cell? Let's start with the cell. We consider the cell the smallest living unit of organization within the body. Throughout this course, we will be talking about different kinds of cells and the different functions they have in the oral cavity. It'll be important to remember, however, that even though different cells have different functions, they have the exact same DNA. So how is it that all of our cells can have the same DNA? but some of our cells will express some genes and other cells other genes, which will give them different functions. Throughout this course, we will see that cells with similar functions are often grouped together. And when we can point to a group of cells that all look similar, we call that a tissue. When there are multiple tissues grouped together in some sort of structure, we often call that some sort of organ. And if we have multiple organs grouped together, such as within the oral cavity, we might consider that an organ system. The exterior border of every human cell is the plasma membrane. It is composed of a phospholipid bilayer. Hopefully you remember phospholipids as those small molecules with a polar head group and two nonpolar fatty acid tails. Found within this bilayer is cholesterol and then another important molecule, proteins. Different proteins will serve different functions here in the plasma membrane. But as a whole, the plasma membrane separates the inside of any cell from the outside of the cell and helps to regulate what is able to get in and out. As I mentioned earlier, one of the main functions of the plasma membrane is to regulate how permeable the cell is to specific molecules. Cells could be freely permeable or they can be impermeable to certain molecules or frequently, we will see this phrase here, selectively permeable. That means the cell allows some substances in, 
while blocking other substances. And the amounts of substances that move in or out may change depending on the environment. Permeability can be active or passive. If it's active, we have to use ATP, but if it's passive, we can rely on diffusion and osmosis. Osmosis is the movement of water. Diffusion is the movement of any other molecule down its concentration gradient. One note on that is when we talk about the concentration gradient involved in osmosis, we often flip things in reverse. Rather than saying water moves from high water concentration to low water concentration, we instead say that water moves from low solute to high solute. Higher solutes being where you would find the lower amount of water. After we learn about cells, we can talk about tissues. And if a bunch of cells are allowing molecules to enter and then exit, we can say that that tissue is involved in filtration. It regulates the movement of substances across a tissue into another region of the body. On the other side of the plasma membrane, we will find cytoplasm and organelles. The cytoplasm of a cell is a bunch of gelatinous material. It's mostly water, plus a lot of solutes. Those could be nutrients, electrolytes, proteins, or other large molecules. Some of those are going to include cytoskeletal proteins that we'll talk about in an upcoming slide. Larger structures found within the cell are called organelles. And these are usually surrounded by their own lipid bilayer. Although we don't call it the plasma membrane, it is another phospholipid bilayer separating the organelle from the cytoplasm. One of the biggest and most noticeable organelles in any cell is the nucleus. This is where you can find almost all of the DNA within a cell. I should note we should exclude red blood cells and a couple of others from this list, but they at one point did have a nucleus. The DNA that would be found outside of the nucleus is a small amount found within mitochondria, and that's not going to be relevant to anything in dental hygiene that I know of. So we will focus on the DNA within the nucleus, which will be very relevant to this course. That DNA is usually in the form of chromatin, just a whole bunch of DNA floating around the nucleus. During mitosis, that DNA is condensed into structures that can be seen under the microscope known as chromosomes. This DNA has been packed just like you would package up all of your belongings when you are moving. You're not going to be using any of your belongings during this time. Therefore, we're going to be much more interested in DNA in the chromatin state because it's in this state where it's actually functioning. And when this DNA is functioning, it will have to be transcribed, meaning we'll make a copy of that DNA into RNA, which can then exit the nucleus. When regions of DNA known as genes are transcribed into RNA, we call that gene expression. Gene expression can change over time, either short or long amounts of time. Cells can alter their gene expression over short amount of time using transcription factors. These are proteins that can bind directly to DNA and along with other transcription factors, recruit the enzyme RNA polymerase, which is responsible for copying the DNA into an RNA copy, which can later be converted into a protein. We would say that is turning on gene expression. Other transcription factors may do the exact opposite, inhibit the expression of genes by blocking RNA polymerase from getting to DNA and copying it into RNA. The activity of these transcription factors is often regulated by extracellular signals such as hormones.
This allows cells to change their DNA expression in response to environmental changes. For instance, women do not need to be making pregnancy related proteins except when they are pregnant. And so pregnancy hormones like estrogen and progesterone or human chorionic gonadotropin signal changes in gene expression in many tissues throughout the female body during pregnancy. On the other hand, some changes in gene expression are more permanent. This involves a different type of interaction and modification of DNA. First, DNA can be methylated. A methyl group is covalently attached to the DNA. This pattern of methylation is copied to the new strand of DNA during mitosis. If that fact does not seem significant now, remember that I mentioned this when we start talking about differentiation and cell fate. Along with methylation though, DNA can then be packaged up around large proteins known as histones. And this effectively puts that little region of DNA into long-term storage. Cells will do that after they have made a decision as to what they're going to be when they grow up. Once they have decided, they can package all of the other genes that they will never need around histones and never use them again. This process is regulated by extracellular signals that are similar to hormones, but are given a different name known as morphogens. And these changes in DNA expression go along with cellular differentiation rather than environmental changes. For a little bit of a visual aid, here are two cartoons about what I just discussed. Short-term DNA regulation is mediated by proteins called transcription factors, which can bind to DNA and allow the transcription of a gene. Long-term DNA regulation involves the addition of methyl groups, which then allows this region of DNA to be packaged around a large histone and effectively put into deep storage. Human cells contain about 30,000 genes. This is an inexact number because not everybody counts the same way. All humans have the same number of genes in all of our cells, uh, with the exception of some sex-linked traits that may or may not be found on the Y chromosome. For all of our other genes, we have two copies of each, known as alleles one of which that we inherited from mother and one of which we inherited from father. In histology, we can visualize DNA thanks to this chemical here called hematoxylin. This chemical can bind to DNA. And what makes it useful is that this chemical also has a color, a bluish or purplish hue to it. So frequently, we will be looking at images that have been stained with hematoxylin and another stain called eosin, which is pink, such as this image over here. And thanks to the hematoxylin, I can easily identify all of the different nucleuses. Even my cat Chester agrees. And I would say that we are looking at probably hundreds of different cells within this image over here. Each one of these individual little purple circles is one nucleus. And each human cell should only have one nucleus. Now, it's hard for me to spot anything else belonging to these cells, including their cytoplasm and plasma membrane. But based on their nucleuses, I've got a rough estimate of where each cell is located. Now, just for fun, there's some interesting history that goes along with hematoxylin. It is derived from a tree that grows in Central America, and it was one of the first exports from the Spanish conquerors brought back to Europe, and it radically altered the European textile industry. 
Europeans no longer had to rely on very expensive dyes that came from rare shellfish in the Mediterranean or expensive dyes from the Far East. The next organelle to review are mitochondria. This is where all of the ATP is generated within cells undergoing aerobic respiration. And this molecule ATP, or adenosine triphosphate, is the major energy molecule found within all human cells. Next are ribosomes. These are not technically organelles because they are not surrounded by a phospholipid bilayer. They are instead large proteins and bunches of RNA grouped together that can be seen under fairly powerful microscopes. There are a lot of ribosomes just floating around the cytoplasm. We would call those free ribosomes. And there are also a number of ribosomes found on the endoplasmic reticulum. And when they are, we would call that the rough endoplasmic reticulum. The endoplasmic reticulum is a phospholipid bilayer surrounded organelle, meaning it's got a distinct inside and outside. There's two types of endoplasmic reticulum. There's a smooth and a rough endoplasmic reticulum. The smooth endoplasmic reticulum is involved in the storage of calcium and in the production of certain lipids within the cell. Whereas the rough endoplasmic reticulum, the one with all of the ribosomes, is where proteins that are either going to be secreted or inserted into the plasma membrane are produced. When these proteins are transcribed from RNA that came from the nucleus, they would next be sent to the Golgi apparatus before winding up in their final destination. The Golgi apparatus is another phospholipid bound organelle, and here we say that proteins are modified before they reach their last destination. One example of protein modification would be the cleavage of a large polypeptide, the amyloid precursor protein, into a beta 42. From the Golgi, proteins can then be delivered to the plasma membrane via vesicles. The next organelle are lysosomes. These are produced by the Golgi complex and contain acids and digestive enzymes. And so they are often mistakenly thought of as little stomachs found within a cell. The reason I say mistakenly is because we often think of the stomach as part of the digestive system which is responsible for breaking down large molecules into smaller molecules that we use for nutrition. And lysosomes really have nothing to do with nutrients. Instead, think of them more like the recycling station found within cells. Old proteins and bits of garbage that the cell has ingested can be sent to lysosomes for destruction. But this is not where cells get nutrients. Nutrients would diffuse or be actively transported across the plasma membrane. The cytoskeleton is a bunch of proteins found within the cytoplasm. These proteins are massive. They are large polymers that give the cell its particular shape and through the process of polymerization and depolymerization, these proteins can allow the cell to change its shape or to move. Specializations of the cytoskeleton include structures found at the cell surface, including cilia and microvilli. Cilia move. Unlike bacteria, cilia on human cells don't move cells around, they instead move substances across the cells, such as moving mucus up and out of our airways. Microvilli do not move. These structures at the cell surface increase surface area, like folding paper into origami. Found within the cytoplasm might be a number of inclusions, structures that we can see under the microscope, 
that aren't just basic boring old cytoplasm. This may include deposits of glycogen within muscle cells, lipids, especially found within adipocytes. Melanin can be found in inclusions within the skin. And you can find crystallized proteins found within the lens. Next up, we need to cover a few cellular processes that will be relevant to dental hygiene, or at the very least relevant to this course on histology and embryology. That includes mitosis or cell division. We need to talk about ways that cells can communicate with other cells. And lastly, we'll talk about endo and exocytosis. Let's start with cell division or mitosis. Cells that are capable of undergoing mitosis actually spend very little of their lifetime doing so. They instead spend most of their time in what we're going to call some other part of the cell cycle. It's during these times that cells are doing other stuff besides dividing their DNA in half. The cell cycle can be divided into a number of different stages, and these stages are regulated by what are known as cell cycle checkpoints. This is where the cell can halt or continue forward, moving closer to another round of cell division. If a cell halts at a cell cycle, it may undergo apoptosis or programmed cell death. For instance, cells can monitor for DNA damage. And if they acquire too many mutations, rather than going through another round of mitosis and possibly creating a tumor, they instead undergo apoptosis. The cell cycle checkpoints have two major regulators, the first being cyclins and the second being enzymes known as cyclin-dependent kinases. The cyclin-dependent kinases can attach a phosphate group to the cyclins, but it takes them some time to do so. Eventually, enough phosphocyclin will accumulate within the cell that it can begin binding to DNA and altering the transcription of genes that will need to be turned on for the cell to switch from one phase of the cell cycle to the next. Therefore, these cyclins activate genes involved in the next phase of the cell cycle. For instance, DNA polymerase needs to be turned on during the S phase. This duplicates the DNA found within the cell, allowing the cell to later split that DNA in half during mitosis. If the cyclins and CDKs are like the gas pedal of the cell cycle, another major regulator can be thought of as the brakes, and these are collectively known as tumor suppressor genes. They prevent cells from transitioning from one phase of the cell cycle to the next. For somebody to get cancer, cells have to go through the cell cycle at a rapid rate. For this reason, most cancers have mutations to tumor suppressor genes found within the cancerous cells. One of the most famous examples is a gene called P53, which is mutated in more than half of all cancers. If a cell passes through all of the cell cycle checkpoints, it can then enter mitosis where that one cell, which now has double the amount of DNA that it really needs, divides that DNA in half and produces two identical daughter cells. These cells would then enter interphase, or all of the time that's not mitosis. It's during interphase that all of the interesting stuff happens, like cells producing saliva in the salivary glands or cells producing enamel and dentin during tooth formation. It's during interphase that there are going to be changes 
to DNA expression that lead to these different cells having different jobs. Another very important process is apoptosis or programmed cell death. It may seem strange to talk about cell death in a class that focuses on the early growth of a human being. But in fact, cell death is a very important part of the growth process. And one reason that it's so important is that in order to build all of the structures that we're going to need, gingiva and teeth and salivary glands, we can't build these structures from scratch. Instead, cells will often build a scaffolding first that allows the cells that we're going to need in adulthood to use as a foothold while they build these more mature structures. And after we have the mature structure, the scaffolding can be removed. The removal of cells in an organized fashion is apoptosis. Another very important process is cellular differentiation which really just means cells becoming different from other cells. Now, that may seem simple, but keep in mind that all of these different cells found within the human body have the exact same DNA. So differentiation is the process where cells decide which parts of their DNA they're going to use and which parts they aren't. In cancer, cells often lose these decisions. But in adult tissues, different looking cells often look different because they've received signals that have instructed them to become different. These signals can be endocrine or paracrine in nature, which means either long range or short range signals. Let's take a look at this hypothetical situation over here where I've got some boring looking epithelial cells and some boring looking fibroblasts down here. Mitosis will produce a bunch of clones of these epithelial cells and they will all look exactly the same. But eventually we're going to want some of these cells to behave differently. Let's say that some of these epithelial cells receive a signal from the fibroblasts but only the ones that come in contact with those fibroblasts. That signal could alter DNA expression patterns within those cells, and they would start looking and behaving differently. We would say those cells have differentiated, and they might, for instance, start secreting dentin. These cells might furthermore release other signals that cause the boring old epithelial cells next to them to differentiate, to become different from the original epithelial cell, but also different from the odontoblasts. And then, hypothetically speaking, these new epithelial cells might start secreting enamel, and we would call them ameloblasts. So we'll obviously look at this process in a lot more detail, and I'll have to fix a few mistakes that I made in this gross generalization, but basically, this is differentiation in a nutshell. Cells starting to behave and look different than they did a few days before. One concept that goes along with differentiation is that as a cell differentiates and becomes more specialized, it becomes more limited in what it can be in the future. Its cell fate becomes limited. Stem cells are cells that haven't differentiated. They haven't made many decisions as to what they're going to become when they grow up. So we would say their cell fate is very broad. They can become all sorts of different types of cells. But along the way, as these cells undergo mitosis, they'll make copies of themselves. But as those copies undergo differentiation, their fate becomes limited.
For instance, cells over here might only be able to become muscle and connective tissue, whereas these types of cells over here might be able to become different types of epithelial cells. This is a concept that we will be covering a lot throughout the term. Stem cells tend to have a very broad fate. They can become just about anything, whereas differentiated cells tend to only be able to become a few or possibly even only one type of cell after it goes through mitosis. The next concept that we need to cover is that there's a lot of important stuff made by cells that's found outside of cells. And we can call this extracellular fluid if it's liquidy enough. Although if it's not terribly liquid, we would then call it extracellular matrix. But this is material made by the cells and then secreted. This may include large proteins or carbohydrates that can then attract water from our blood plasma to generate what we would consider the extracellular matrix or all of the stuff found outside of our cells. If all of the stuff found outside of cells doesn't have any particular shape or structure and instead just looks like a bunch of goop, we would call that ground substance. Ground substance is a gel. It is made by polysaccharides and proteins made within the cells that are then secreted. And when they're outside of cells, those solutes can attract water and hold it into place. Exactly the same way that powdered jello, when mixed with water, holds the water into place in a gel matrix. One of the major polysaccharides found in ground substance is this molecule here, hyaluronic acid. We can't see this molecule under the microscope, but we can kind of see where it is because the background would have this just diffuse color to it. The molecules found within ground substance such as hyaluronic acid, can have applications relevant to dentistry, which if you're curious, follow this link and there will be plenty of reading material for you. Other things found outside of cells can be seen under the microscope because they're large enough and dark enough. These include a number of fibers, including fibronectin, Fibronectin, we will see throughout this term, can carry very important information about where a cell is located based off of what the extracellular matrix is telling it. Another very important fiber, and this one is definitely visible under the microscope, is collagen. This is a very strong fiber. It's a protein made by cells that is then wound around other versions of itself which are then wound around other versions of themselves until it's a very, very large protein found outside of the cells. This protein binds to this E here, or the eosin stain found in our typical pink and purple stain. Lastly, we need to cover a few intercellular junctions. These are connections between cells or between a single cell and the extracellular matrix. These may be structural or they may be involved in communication. So let's discuss three types of intercellular junctions. The first are not visible under your typical light microscope and include cell adhesion molecules and integrins. These are proteins found on the surface of cells. Because they're found on the plasma membrane, that means they were synthesized in the rough endoplasmic reticulum and went through the Golgi before reaching the cell surface. Cell adhesion molecules come in different flavors, and they only stick 
to another cell adhesion molecule of the same flavor. This is what allows an epithelial cell to stick to another epithelial cell rather than sticking to a muscle cell or a brain cell. Another very important connection are the integrins. These are proteins found on the surface of cells that allow them to stick to specific extracellular matrix proteins. For instance, they may stick to collagen or to specific types of hyaluronic acid or fibronectin. Next are the desmosomes, or you may call them anchoring junctions. These are large structures found between two cells that anchor them together and then anchor that connection to the cytoskeleton. This makes for a very strong connection between two cells. For instance, we find this in epithelial cells and cardiac muscle cells, and it holds these tissues together. An anchoring junction that doesn't anchor to another one, but instead to the extracellular matrix would be called a hemidesmosome, or you might think of that as half of an anchoring junction. But it's another way to keep a cell in place. Rather than anchoring it to another cell, we've anchored it to some extracellular matrix protein. For instance, this is what allows some epithelial cells, not all, but a very specialized type of epithelial cell, allows it to stick to the enamel of a tooth. As their name should suggest, anchoring junctions hold cells in place by either anchoring them to other cells or anchoring them to extracellular matrix proteins. If cells need to move, therefore, they must remove any of their anchoring junctions. We're going to see this happen during wound healing as cells migrate over a wounded area to regenerate the tissue that was lost. We'll also see it during the process of gastrulation, which right now probably just looks like a funny word, but by the end of this term, you should know is very important. We'll also see this happen with neural crest cells as they migrate, leaving the brain and moving to places to form things like the branchial arches or to form the beginnings of teeth. We also see this happening as cancer cells metastasize throughout the body. So the removal of anchoring junctions is very important in medicine, well beyond the realms of dentistry and dental hygiene. The last type of cellular junction I need to cover are the gap junctions, which unlike desmosomes aren't really structural. Instead, these are involved in cell-to-cell -cell communication. Gap junctions allow cells to communicate chemically or electrically with their immediate neighbors. And as we're going to see this term, this is very important in establishing what is called planar cell polarity. Planar cell polarity just means that cells have different sides. For instance, epithelial cells may have a distinct top versus bottom side. But planar polarity means they have a distinct front and back side as well. These sides would be different from one another. Why is this important, you might ask? Well, there's going to be a number of important processes that we do not want occurring everywhere. And instead, we need to establish some patterns between cells. Cell-to-cell -cell communication through gap junctions, for instance, can allow these cells to communicate and differentiate differently from one another, allowing the pink cells, for instance, to form tooth buds, but the gray cell here to not form a tooth bud. And this means we're going to have spacing between the teeth. The last concept that we need to cover is how things can get from inside of the cell to the outside or from the outside to the inside. If this occurs across the plasma membrane, 
we would say it's occurring by diffusion, facilitated diffusion, or active transport, and would involve some type of protein found within the plasma membrane. Diffusion is passive, so molecules would be moving down their concentration gradient. Facilitated diffusion is also passive, but proteins would be helping out here, allowing certain molecules, but not others, to move down their concentration gradient. Neither of these examples would involve the use of energy. Active transport, on the other hand, would be the movement of molecules against their concentration gradient across the plasma membrane using some sort of transport protein that has to burn ATP in the process to provide the energy to move the molecules against their gradients. The last two, endo and exocytosis, involve the movement of large numbers of molecules all at once, but not across the plasma membrane. Instead, these molecules would be engulfed into a organelle such as a vesicle. Exocytosis would be that process in reverse, the movement of a large organelle so that it fuses with the plasma membrane and everything found inside of it would then exit the cell. So that's all of the basic cell biology that we need to review. Let's jump back to our case study and talk about the use of hyaluronic acid in dentistry. It can be applied to surgical wounds to reduce scar tissue formation. It can be used as a filler in many surgeries, used instead of grafting human tissues from another part of the body. And we would say that hyaluronic acid can form a scaffold. Hyaluronic acid is a carbohydrate that is secreted by these types of cells here that we'll learn about later, epithelia and fibroblasts. So let's go to our questions. What have we learned so far? Well, you may not know everything about hyaluronic acid, but with a little bit of basic cell biology, we can answer these questions here. Where would hyaluronic acid normally be found? Well, if you go back a ways, you may recall that hyaluronic acid is one of those large molecules found within the ground substance, which would make it a part of extracellular matrix. Based off of that, which of the cellular attachments might hyaluronic acid affect? Well, we didn't go into tight junctions, so let's rule that one out. And desmosomes, we said, were between two cells. And ground substance is not a cell. Similarly, gap junctions were between two cells. So we can rule that one out. And that leaves the correct answer here, hemidesmosomes. And in fact, cells can attach to this hyaluronic acid found in the ground substance. Okay, last question. Other components of the extracellular matrix include large proteins. Hyaluronic acid was a carbohydrate, making it more like a sugar. Where would these proteins be synthesized? Would they be synthesized in the cytoplasm by free ribosomes or by ribosomes on the rough endoplasmic reticulum? These are really our only two choices of ribosomes. The free ribosomes make proteins that stay in the cytoplasm, so that's not the correct answer. It's in fact the ribosomes on the rough endoplasmic reticulum that synthesize proteins that are eventually going to be excreted from the cell. And if you're going to be found in the extracellular matrix, that means you've been excreted outside of a cell. Here's a few more review questions I could throw at you. The main functions of ribosomes is which of the following? Well, we know that ribosomes produce proteins. They get the instructions from RNA that comes from the nucleus, but they then translate that RNA into protein. Next, what's the job of the Golgi apparatus? Well, hopefully you remember, oh, let's see here, where is that? Uh, oh, based off of this, I was looking for something that said modification of proteins, 
but after those proteins are modified, they are next packaged and sent to their final destination. Let's go over to this question here. Cells of the stratum spinosum layer of a stratified squamous epithelium are attached to one another by which of the following? Okay, there's a lot of words in there that we don't recognize yet. That's okay. Let's focus on the attachment. If it's cells attached to other cells, and we're talking structural attachments, hopefully you've identified the answer as desmosomes. Our last question here, organelles that contain enzymes and acids of destroying debris. Oh, that's going back to our lysosomes. So, so that's just going to bring us to these two histology pictures that I threw at you at the very beginning of the lecture and asked, how many cells do you see? Honestly, I can't really see the cells in either of these pictures. I can, however, spot their nucleuses because those organelles tend to stain darkly and a dark purple using our most common pink and purple stain, otherwise known as hematoxylin and eosin. So I've outlined just one nucleus here on this image. Over here, uh, we've zoomed out a ways, so the nucleuses look smaller, but there's another nucleus there. And for each nucleus, there must be one cell. It's a little bit harder to spot the nucleuses over here because this little purple nucleus here is surrounded by a bunch of purple ground substance. The ground substance is staining purple here because that hematoxylin stain isn't perfect. It's just a chemical that sticks to stuff. And it's usually DNA, but sometimes it can stick to some other things that are found in some other places. And so in this image over here, we've got a bunch of purple background with some purple nucleuses embedded within it. So I would say we're looking at hundreds of cells in each of these pictures. It's definitely more than one or 10, and it's definitely not a million. And I don't think it's quite enough to count as a thousand. So if you can see the nucleuses in these pictures, then you can more or less spot the cells. And you're going to be prepared for the next lecture where we talk about groups of cells found within tissues. And what that is going to mean is that this stuff here looks different from, from this stuff down here. We're going to call those two different types of tissues. Or over here, all of these cells look a bit different from the cells that you find over here. So we're going to have two more tissues. But that's going to wrap up this lecture.